Welcome one and all to another episode of Interverse Podcast. My name is Chance and this is Season 3, Episode 3, with none other than the return of Matt Blystone. If you remember back in Episode 19 of Season 1 of the podcast, Matt is uh, one of the guys I talked to in that particular episode. He runs Theta Float Spa. Theta is a place where you can go in Springfield, Missouri, if you want to experience the complete lack of sensory experience. And that is a pretty cool thing to do. We talk about why in this here episode, if you've not heard of float tanks and you're interested at all, uh, I recommend checking it out because it's a really tried and tested way to relieve your body of tension and pain. And also your mind can be eased to the burdens of everyday life because you're able to get in there and just breathe and close your eyes and float and enter the void or oblivion or whatever. It's pretty, it's pretty great. It's really awesome. If you do want to check it out and you are around the Springfield, Missouri area, you can go into Theta and mention that you heard Matt on this episode and get a, a 90 minute float for the cost of a 60 minute float. So that's a pretty cool deal. Thank you, Matt. And so Matt is somebody I have come to admire quite a bit because he really does seem to have his shit together and he's running his own company in the form of Theta. You know, I'm not without help. He's got um, business partners and all that, but, and, and uh, I'm sure many people have been of assistance throughout the journey. And that's one of the things we kind of talk about. And one of the things I like about Matt is he's got a keen eye to recognize synchronicity in the world when it's happening. And he seems to be a pretty heart opened guy and awesome to, uh, to reflect with. Yeah, this is a great combo. And I think there's a lot to explore here as uh, future conversations will develop between he and I. If you like the music in this episode, go check out Dreamer's Delight on YouTube or SoundCloud. Awesome music I found out about when I was at Envision Festival this year. And since we talk a lot about dreams and uh, the philosophy, psychology of Carl Jung, I thought, why not use Dreamer's Delight? So thanks for letting me use your music, dude. Always a pleasure to listen to it, that's for sure. A delight, you could even say. <laughs> and I'd like to remind everyone, you can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes podcast app. You can subscribe on YouTube. And sometimes there's even extra stuff going on on YouTube, like video versions of episodes. And you can also pledge to the podcast on patreon.com. The links to all this st uh, stuff I'm talking about is going to be in the full episode description notes. You'll be able to find your way to Patreon or Dreamer's Delight or Theta's website, whatever you want. So check that out if you want more info about any of this stuff. And remember, if you do sign up for Patreon, you will be supporting my life's work here with this podcast and helping me dream a more harmonious dream for myself and eventually maybe even get new equipment for this podcast and improve the audio quality further is a never ending battle to uh, improve equipment and learn more about audio editing. And I want to increase the production value of the show as much as I can. So if you guys want to be really swell, you could go pledge on Patreon. I, I cannot express how much I appreciate the 44 of you now who are pledged there. And I will remind everyone also that there is a contest going on right now where if you make a profile on Eureka.org, you can get a possible prize bag from me where I send you some art and crystals and other mystery goodies. And that contest is going on until the middle of June. And all you have to do is make a profile on Eureka.org. I think you'll like it. It's a cool website. But even if you don't, why not enter and possibly get a prize? So go check that out. You know if you want to. And we will go ahead and get on to the episode with Matt Blystone. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. I hope you find it interesting, informative, entertaining, or something, something good. And I hope you have a week of making good for yourself and the people that you care about. So now that we've set our intentions, let's talk to Matt Blystone. <laughs>
Okay, here we go. We got Matt Blystone returning to the podcast for the first time in a while. What's up, dude? Hey, what's up, guys? Just so, chilling. So, Matt, tell them who you are. So, uh, I'm a local Springfieldian slash traveler slash rider slash a lot of things, but um, I started a Theta Float Spa here in town so that I can, uh, you know, help people kind of evolve their consciousness and, uh, you know, treat their physical ailments as well. So... Yeah, that's um, that's kind of a tall order right there. Involved their consciousness by going uh, into know. a completely stimulus-free space for um, an extended period of time. That does give someone a direct mirror on their own self. So that's a pretty fantastic tool for analyzing any aspect of what might be causing you discomfort about yourself, whether that's something physical or mental. Sure. And we have a lot of people who, uh, you know, they come out of the tank and they're like, man, I was just having memories I haven't thought of in 20 years, you know, or, uh, had, had one lady come out and, uh, remembered something from when she was two, like a traumatic event when she was two years old. And she didn't even think it was an actual memory until she told her mom that she thought about it. And her mom was like, Oh yeah, that happened. So it's wow. weird stuff. Yeah, that people report that kind of thing in deep meditation practices, but it's like it takes so much meditating and practice to even get to the point where you can forget your physical body and like the time and place you're at and what you need to do next enough that you can actually go back to those deep level uh, core events and reanalyze them and reintegrate them, which that's even... You know, that's another topic of conversation. Why would you want to go back to a memory when you're two that was traumatic? Um, what would you say the benefit is of being able to reanalyze that kind of thing? Well, I think having any kind of um, story in your psyche uh, from the past that is, is possibly negative or hindering or causes anxiety around certain patterns or events, um, to readdress that and kind of rewrite the story about it, um, you know, put a positive spin on that. It really kind of takes it from being this, this negative thing to being a, uh, a key to evolve past that. And I feel like the more you do that, the more you, um, you look at these things you've done in your life and you may see them as bad or mistakes or whatever, you can go back and just, figure out what you learned from it, you know, and then all of a sudden you have a life of positivity and you don't have any regrets and you don't have any negative stories. You know, it all just turns into this one positive life journey. Yeah. I think one of the reasons why we don't have the ability to do that with um, even some things that are pretty basic and not even that traumatic potentially, it, it's just like, we are so busy. We're so kept in the mode of, doing the next thing that we don't even have time to look back and go, wow, I was kind of a jerk to this person and I didn't let myself feel how I made them feel. So I just buried it and I needed to think about that a little more. You know, you don't even, you don't even get those little things just from two days ago. Those, those go under the radar and they like pile on material density to your consciousness. The longer you go without a sort of cleansing and uh <laughs> defragmentation yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean it's going to happen one way or the other in my opinion um, it really almost doesn't matter your religious tradition or spiritual persuasion if you have the thought that there's something after life most people tend to agree that for whatever reason there's going to be a review of what your life was like and so that entails not just those moments that you're forgetting but also every little moment that um, happens period and most importantly what you made other people feel like during those moments as opposed to just what it made you feel like right so if you get the review out of the way then whenever you die you don't have to do that you just get to go to the big party yeah you, you know there's, there's no like after death review you're like oh i already did that it's, it's like being an overachiever at school and you got a book report done you know well maybe you're going way to go back and watch all that stuff again because guess what you didn't figure it out while you're alive so now you're gonna be you gotta go do this again and figure out uh a better way of doing it and maybe maybe you are literally like doing the in-between work of between lives and integrating things whenever you're sitting in a flotation tank uh, with absolutely no stimulus for an hour and a half. 
Yeah. I mean, not everyone, I'm sure. Like, that's a, maybe a big, we're not going to put that on the label. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not something everybody experiences. Um, but, you know, what's interesting is uh, the people who typically experience that stuff are the people you would never expect. You know, like you have people who, you know, meditate on a regular basis or they're into esoteric things. And a lot of times they'll come and float and uh, they will have these expectations, you know, and their expectations will keep them from experiencing some things. But then you'll have some some like, uh, you know, not to be stereotypical, but like a country guy with a camouflage hat come in there and, you know, talk about how he doesn't even know what he's doing there. And then he'll get in the tank. And when he comes out, he just has this mind. He had this mind blowing experience, you know, and he has no clue what to think of it, you know. And um, it's because he went in there with, uh, you know, a blank slate. You know, he just he had no preconceived notion of what he was doing or what was going to happen. So he was in a state of allowing. He allowed the experience to happen instead of trying to, like, seek the experience or you know, force it. Man, that's a really deep, deep realization. Um, I think it is, I think the problem that I've got personally, um, preconceived notions, is why I have a personal philosophy of taking a metaphysical dump as often as I can, like maybe once a day even, where I just like forget everything I know for a while and act like I don't know anything because, um, Preconceived notions either get you disappointment or get you scared, typically, one or the other. Uh, yeah. Like, really, though, the just going in there and letting your mind wander to where it will, that is going to allow your unconscious mind, as we were talking about um, in relation to Jungian psychology, to start communicating with you more directly. Yeah, and, and wasn't that a trip the other day? Yeah. And we were, uh, uh, Dr. Andrew, what was his last name? I can uh, make sure and reference it in the episode. Yeah, sure, sure. Andrew something. Yeah, a Jungian analyst. And uh, he just kind of blew both our minds with, with some of the things he said. Uh, for me, what was what was most profound that he said was um, the thing about uh, lucid dreams. Because, yeah. you know, in the tank, a lot of times you'll experience kind of a lucid dream state. And according to Jungian psychology... There is no control over the over the dream. Like the dream is kind of tricking you in a way to thinking that you're in control of it. Which uh Because it wants to give you that message for whatever reason. Sure. Yeah. And it's uh And I think maybe like to, So first of all, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I also can't not agree with it. It's just one it's like one of those paradoxical things. Um it could be either way really. It could be both. It could be that the dream is giving you the experience, but you are able to exert some influence over it, just not as much as you think you are, you know? Sure. But as to why, why would your unconscious mind give you that experience? Because it's given it to me before. Um, I can think of a particular really um, fun example. One of my favorite dreams that I remember in the dream, I was coming back from the music festival, electric forest. I was in a van with a bunch of my friends and I thought, Hey, wait, I'm already back from electric forest. How am I coming back again? Because it had been a few days or weeks or whatever. And uh, so that moment, my mind goes, well, you must be dreaming right now. And I go, definitely. So the van is on the highway going 70 plus miles per hour. And I just open the door of the moving van and jump out and fly off. And it was like the coolest dream ever. <laughs> and what I think if I was supposed to be receiving a message at that time, the message was to... Um, <laughs> You're already you you are already ready to take off and start controlling your own destiny more in waking life. Um, you've are, you're back from whatever hero's journey it is that was required uh, to the other side, if you will, to come back and bring helpful information to the people of Earth. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say uh, you know most of my dreams that I remember long term have been kind of apocalyptic. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, and I've, I've watched, the, I've watched the world uh, get destroyed in so many different ways. Me too. You know, have giant and, robots? Uh, no, I have not had giant robots. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. Yeah. See like Godzilla style giant robots duking it out on the horizon. Like Mecha, Mecha Godzilla. And like kinda. having to run away. Well, they're more human looking robots actually. Oh, they really? Look like humans. Okay. They're like humanoid though. They, yeah. they look like Japanese anime robots, you know, gotcha. like, like Megazord shit. 
But a little more deadly. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, also, seen nuclear cloud, uh, blast clouds in the horizon in my dreams before. Mm. Always those dreams are accompanied with another sensation um, every time, which is the feeling of running on grass with my bare feet. Fast, so fast that I can't believe I'm running that fast and for so long. And the feeling also reminds me of the feeling I have in dreams when I can breathe underwater, which is just like I should be winded or gasping and yet I'm breathing perfectly. Yeah. What kind of stuff uh, coincides with your apocalyptic dreams? Um, you know, actually, back whenever I was going to music festivals a lot was when I was having them. And it was almost like every t- like most of my apocalyptic dreams, I was at a music festival or at some kind of like tribal style event, you know, where um, there was intense community, you know, and like with one of them, I remember being at the music festival and uh, this meteor was coming down and we all just kind of stopped and looked at it and there was side playing in the background and, um, you know, it hit and there was this blast, you know, this, like this white light. And then after, after the white light, um, we were like reduced to like cave people. You know, we were still at the festival, but there was very few of us. And we were like just hanging out in rubble and stuff. And there was no music anymore, you know, so. That's I don't know. And then the other night, you know, I dreamt that I could like stand in a forward fold and put my palms on the floor. <laughs> I woke up and thought that was the coolest night ever. A forward fold like. Uh... Yeah. in yoga where you're just like folding forward and, you know, you, at first you start and you're like touching your toes and you're like, sweet, I can touch my toes. And then, you know, you get to a point where you can almost like get your palms to touch the floor. But for some people, that's cake because they've been doing it for so long. But I've been trying for, you know, a long time and I've never done that. So. Yeah, I dreamt about it though. So what's that? What's that symbolism? You know. Well, they say that you can gain abilities or like improve your skill at things in your dreams by practicing them there, and that's another reason why people want to do lucid dreaming. Uh, is that something that's been studied in the tank? Can people visualize doing things in the tank and get noticeable results of? Improvement? Yeah, yeah, I like that you brought that up because actually vis- visualization training is huge. Um, in the tank and a lot of athletes do it. Um, I had one MMA fighter that, uh, he moved, but he would come and, uh, practice before his fights. He would get in the tank and visualize fighting somebody. Yeah. I think you told me about that. Yeah. Maybe in the last one even. Yeah. Yeah, But, but he would get so into it that he would actually like jerk and then he'd splash the water and then be like, Oh crap. You know, I'm in the tank. Wow. So, but his adrenaline, you know, it wasn't a relaxing experience for him. But, um, which is kind of the opposite of why you're in the tank for most people. For care. most people, sure, yeah. Um, but there's golfers and stuff like that that get in there and they visualize their golf swing or, you know. Um, Man, I gotta actually, I have a, I wonder about, sorry to interrupt, but I have a real ponderance about the MMA situation in the tank and the lack of being able to relax. I personally, I've found that people that are engaged in, a, in an activity on a regular basis where they're getting hit in the head a lot. Um, operate at reduced brain function capacity on multiple levels. So this is not to say something negative about martial arts or about sparring, but in terms of actual like MMA fights where it's a competition and you're locked in a cage with somebody else, those are different than sparring matches because you're really going to blast somebody and oh yeah, they're brutal. It's it's brutal. It's one of the it's one of the most damaging potential activities to your brain. Period. And I wonder because people that engage in that type of thing that I've spoken to sometimes seem to have a lower ability to perceive things outside of the physical in general. It's not always because there are many like spiritual fighters. I wonder if there is a capacity though for brain brain damage to be um, or trauma even from being in many fights to be part of why even when he's in the tank, he keeps going through the cycle of fighting and kind of jerking and stuff like that. Yeah. Maybe he thinks he's controlling, but maybe that's just the pattern that his brain is in. So it's going there. instantly. Sure. Well, uh, have, have you ever fought like just sparring and okay. just like martial arts, high blue belt sparring, nothing. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I used to, when I was like 25, 26, I used to train and do uh, mixed martial arts Yeah. and I'd get in a cage and I would fight with guys and stuff. And I tell you what, man, there's the, that in itself is such a spiritual thing. 
Right. It's, I feel like it's a different type of spirituality. It's almost like going back to a more primal time whenever you had to fill this, uh, you had to fill yourself with this, this energy, you know, and it's a very, very sacred energy, very fiery energy. Yeah. But then, you know, you go against this guy and you're trying to defeat him and it's violent and, you know, um, it's not that you want to hurt him. It becomes a contest, you know, but then after afterwards, like there is this closeness between you and that that guy that you were just punching in the face, you know, and it's. Uh, it's I don't know, it's an absurdly intimate experience. Sure. Love and hate um, are part of the same uh, spectrum of energy. They're not actual opposites. So like um, wanting to beat the hell out of that guy is only a degrees removed from wanting to go give him a hug. Sure. As degrees on a spot. That's why they typically end in hugs. <laughs> makes sense. Um, but I guess the, uh, the question is like, I, for me, it is a natural law principle that the initiation of force against another person, which is what you call violence, is, uh, you know, that is wrong and punishable by karmic, re, um, karmic retribution in some form or another. But whenever both people agree, I want to initiate force against the other person. Um, I wonder where like the law, the karmic laws apply there since it's completely voluntary on both ends. And it's not really the same type of violence as like, right. or something. Yeah. Personally, I, I don't think that there's, um, I feel like it's sport and it all depends on your intent. Yeah. You know, if your intent is to really, you know, mess somebody up and like hurt them to the point where it's long lasting, then I think you incur some kind of negative karma. But, um, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of similarity between fighting and just dance. You know, I feel like it's in the same realm of mastering movement. And, um, so in that sense, I feel like it's, uh, it's, you know, well, I guess that's why they call it martial arts because yeah. it's an art form and um, it just has to do with more, uh, more violent means typically. Well, yeah. And the ability to enact force it does not, um, doesn't make somebody a bully. doesn't make someone like a meathead or anything like that. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite statements or quotes on the subject, I cannot recall where it came from. But like the anecdote is a monk was asked why he and his brother and um, practiced physical martial arts in their monastery every day. And he says, it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Freedom is self mastery. is yeah. another way of putting that. And I mean, so martial arts is something I'm very interested to get into once I have more time personally, mm -hmm. not in the, not in the MMA cage fighting sense, but in a, yeah. mind body connection. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really want to learn, um, more of like Kung Fu, you know, something That's that has learn. more like of a, uh, you know, artistic flow to it, you know? Um, I want to learn Kung Fu because it's related to Qigong and Tai Chi. Yeah. yeah I'm already absolutely. super into Qigong and I know that I want to do more Tai Chi. The three are supposed to be part of, a um, three pronged approach to, personal development. Mm. Qigong is the breath and Tai Chi is the, the, um, I guess offensive art and Qi or uh, no defensive art and the uh, Qigong, sorry, Kung Fu is the offensive art. That makes sense. Yeah. Kung, Kung Fu. And Tai Chi is the defensive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. Qigong is like the balancing point, the breath. I totally mangled that. <laughs> <laughs> Just do all three. You'll get yeah. it. <laughs> I'd like to learn all three. I, I, uh, and I'm sure there are so many ways to learn them. So many different schools of thought on all three of those things. That's an yeah. interesting thing. Yeah. 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 Um, it's it, a living practice or living tradition. It's evolving at all times. Yeah. Well, I, I tell you what, like, you know, whenever I, cause I was in the Marine Corps for a very short period of time, like boot camp, And then I broke my shoulder and, and got kicked out, you know, Good for you. fortunately. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was a miracle in disguise, 
but um, they practice uh, McMap, which is a mixed martial arts program. And it is simply to kill the other person or uh, render them incapable of, you know, any movement as quickly as possible. You know, it's, it's very um, geared towards if you're on a battlefield and you want to like, you know, you can't be doing fancy stuff. Right. You know, it's like pluck out an eye, you know, punch them in the throat, stuff like stuff really like that. There's fighting. no. Yeah, it's street fighting pretty much. Um, teaches you how to fight multiple opponents at once. I mean, you know, it's it's one of those things, just like you were saying, it'd be good to know that in, in case you got jumped in an alley or something. Um, but it's definitely not as, I don't know. I feel like martial arts in general are therapeutic. Yeah. The, most of them, the movement and everything, um, just like dance. But something like that is strictly practical, you know. A martial artist, too, is exercising a type of mental discipline and willpower that's different than somebody that's a soldier being trained because typically a person practicing martial arts is doing it because they are choosing to for one thing and also their daily life and situations are unlikely to ever be um, requiring them to actually get into a physical altercation with someone so any application of the skills of force that they've learned has to be chosen for the most part is never going to be like jumping out at them and then they have to engage with their kung fu right whereas the the soldier is being um indoctrinated in many other ways to simply follow orders and not think for themselves about whether they or not they want to exercise the force they can exercise whereas the martial artist is always choosing whether or not they exercise their abilities for themselves yeah it's a different that's a good point to make entirely sure. different thing yeah they're a tool. Yeah. Well, one one is a tool and the other has a tool. <laughs> Unfortunately. Right. Um, I mean, I know a lot of people wound up in that position of joining one of the services whenever they're young because they didn't know what else they might do. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not that different yeah. than other people who just do nothing because they don't know what to do. It's like... Waiting to be told what to do uh, more in, more quickly by becoming a soldier. Though. Yeah. So okay. So here's something interesting on that. Like uh, like I was telling you earlier that book Tribe that I've been reading. Sebastian Younger, the same guy that wrote Perfect Storm. He also created the documentaries uh, Coringal and Restrepo. Really smart. You know, won all kinds of awards. Well, he just you know he's been trying to figure out because whenever he came back from Afghanistan. Um, he himself developed some PTSD, didn't realize he had it, you know, and then he started looking into PTSD and started finding these crazy numbers that like over 50% of the soldiers coming back were starting to get diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And, um, and a lot of those never saw a combat. So he's been kind of, this book is all about him digging into why this is like, why are these people coming back and then not being able to deal with, society and stuff. And it, he, he goes into um, talking about how, you know, for millions of years, humans lived as tribal units. You know, they shared everything. They didn't have a real governing body. It was, you know, just everybody put in, everybody got out. You know, if you didn't put in or you stole or something like that, you were either, you know, uh, completely kicked out of the, the unit or they killed you. You know, it was, there was very serious penalties for people who were not contributing to the community. Um, but there was also these rituals for men to say, hey, now you're a man. These rites of passage, you know. And um, one of the things in our society, that's almost one of the only rites of passage to becoming a man. There's no, like, defined, like, you know, no one says, okay, you graduated high school, now you're a man. Or, you know, there's this, you know, in, in tribal communities, it's always been like acts of courage. You know, you had to complete this race and climb up this cliff or whatever, you know, and if you could do that, you were a man now, you know. And so I feel like a lot of uh, a lot of people turn to the military to figure that out. The other turn is college. Basically. Yeah. Like, you're, and you're, you're really told you have to do one of those two things. And in either case, you're going to be receiving um, a type of indoctrination, too. 
Um, and the rites of passage thing that you're talking about, that is something, at least on the call, like, I'm sure there are many um, aspects of joining the military that initiate certain rites of passage within that hierarchy. Yeah, absolutely. To move up. And, yeah. and in the college setting, where do you go if you are someone that wants to move up hierarchies? You join fraternities or sororities. Mm -hmm. And if that's what you're doing, you're also being initiated into many different types of uh, belief systems, well, belief systems, but also um, actual rites of passage, so to speak, where you might even be asked to do some heinous shit. A lot yeah, of hazing and stuff like that. So well, and he talks about that in the book, too. So the next. So people knowing all this consciously still will not accept. And I, I've been really hitting it hard on people that I know lately about this. But people still, for some reason, are in denial about the fact that the next level up in our society for power seekers and for people that like hierarchies are secret societies that have even more initiatory rites of passage and um, forms of secret indoctrination. Uh, and like the main one in our country is the uh, Freemasonic system. And well, another entrance to that system would be by joining the police because most police op police orders are part of Freemasonic institution as well. Yeah. And so anyway, I guess what I'm saying is like, if there's, there's all these paths set up to try to grab people and um, put them into this track that makes them part of the power structure of how this culture or civilization is running right now and to reinforce itself. So, so are you saying the Freemasons have some kind of pool that is kind of hidden or what? Well, it's, it's not that hidden, but um, to anyone that's looking, they know it's not hidden. But to enough people, it's completely not even known about that the secret society aspect operates no problem. And I'm sure beyond the ones that we can see the surface level of, of secret societies like Freemasonry, there are sub levels of that. I mean, there's skull and bones, for example, at, at Yale, you've heard of them. Hmm. Okay. Well, uh, now are those the lizard people? <laughs> skull and bones are, <laughs> Which one are skull and bones is a real secret society. Yeah. I think it exists at Yale. I'm pretty sure that's the one it's at. Um, we've had, uh, a, a recent Skull and Bones president, George W. Bush, actually, and it is like it's like a secret fraternity where they don't know exactly what they do, but they are grooming the next generation of world leaders, and many people come out of that. And if you want to look into it, there's plenty of evidence that the kind of practices and rituals that they take part in are pretty dark and weird and twisted. Mm. And I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, does it seem to you like um, as soon as Bush got out of office, they gave him a lobotomy? <laughs> like, uh, seriously, he is like a completely different person. He's like a like almost like a child now, you know, and uh, it's, it's, it seems to me like uh, they were probably like, man, this idiot's not going to be able to keep his mouth shut about anything. We need to right. we need to give this guy the, the good stuff. And, and now he's painting pictures of dogs and shit. Yeah, who, who knows? I, I could not even begin to comprehend how one would cope with the psychological trauma of having been responsible for so many people's deaths knowingly. And here's, yeah, that's I a mean, good point, too. One thing about uh, George W. Bush is he's directly overseeing or in some capacity a part of the 9-11 fraud. Fraud is what I'll call it. I mean, that that is another thing that people won't want to talk about or look into, but um, if you think 9-11 has happened the way that you were told to happen, definitely, you're definitely <clears throat> accepting brainwashing and in complete denial because there's so much physical evidence to the contrary that is astounding. Yeah. I mean, there is a lot of weird stuff about it. And, you know, I will never say that I know one way or another, but I definitely yeah. think it takes, it needs some more investigation. Uh, you know what I mean? Been investigating it and the, I, I investigated it from the occult aspect recently, and just that alone was completely mind blowing. Um, the numbers of the flights used, the floors that they hit, all the numbers involved with the entire scenario have occult significance, including the years the tower was built and the year that they fell. But that's not even where the real evidence of it, the main story being bullshit, comes in. 
that the real evidence is from just doing the simple force calculation required to see how uh, much force would be required for the towers to come down at free fall speed into their own path of most resistance. And just from just go get your uh, textbook from high school physics class and you'll be able to get the equations you need to do that force calculation and see. Oh, no, it could not have happened that way. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff. Like they found the passport in the rubble of the <laughs> hijacker, you know. Um, when the after it was dust, it was all dust. Yeah, and it, the passport had to have been in the jet that exploded from jet fuel that burned steel beams and somehow eventually caused Building 7 to collapse um, as well, which is... <laughs> building 7 is the real evidence that's the like the most powerful evidence that you need that building should not have collapsed if the official story is to believe be believed. yeah yeah well nobody ever talks about building seven anymore anyway it's just like you know so i'll just link some uh 9 11 truth information <laughs> at this point and um we can maybe go elsewhere back into the significance of this because there there is actually now here's this is actually a good segue we're talking about Jung before and the unconscious trying to communicate to the conscious mind. Well, there's a concept in the occult called synchromysticism. So what synchromysticism is, is when, similar to Jung's idea of synchronicity in one's yeah. personal life, where something can occur that seems completely beyond all probability, that, but it has significance to the individual, there are events that have synchromystic significance as well, and 9-11 is most certainly one. Mm. Uh, the numbers 9 and 11 are both in a occult understanding, in gematria understanding, uh, significant numbers. But most significantly, it's in um, Kabbalistic understanding that 9 and 11 are considered not, not nice numbers, I guess you could say. Because Kabbalah is all about the 10 emanations from source called the Sephiroth. And... One of the ancient prescriptions in the Kabbalah is that you should never add or take away from the 10 because that is the perfect understanding. And whether or not you believe that is really irrelevant. I'm, what I'm trying to point out is that the secret societies that organize events like this that have either synchromistic or intentionally symbolic significance like 9-11, which is an event chock full of Kabbalistic significance, the or you could call it Klepothic Kabbalah because that's the uh, the dark inversion of Tree of Life symbolism. Um, those those very significant numerical symbols and um, tarot-based symbols, like the towers themselves, are conveying to our conscious mind from our unconscious mind the fact that we are in a big uh, <laughs> mind-controlled simulated reality from our uh you know from birth not saying that the physical world you're in isn't physically real but that the worldview that we have and our understanding of even our very selves or lack thereof i should say is um being concealed for, from us deliberately by the forces that we entrust with our safety and call the government and 9-11 is symbolic of our collective unconscious trying to reach out and wake up our collective consciousness <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. Sounds a lot like the book I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's in the works. Um Is it your sci fi? Yeah, it's my first sci fi novel slash romance slash uh you know, um kind of dystopian thing, you know. Everyone's into dystopia now. I've been into it. I'm like a dy dystopian hipster. I was Gee. yeah, I was into dystopia way back in the day. But uh yeah, no, it's just a, it's my first my first attempt at a book. So we'll see, you know, but it's just kind of uh, it really tackles the sociological impact of, um, you know, uh, technology and human augmentation and stuff. But one of the main features of it is uh, the government has been um, removed, you know, by. Uh, well, I don't want to get too much into it because, you know, it's a secret. It's a secret right now. But man, I was really interested though. The government has been removed. I kind of want to know a little, I'll a little <laughs> bit of a spoiler. I'll forget it by the time I read it. Yeah. Book. Well, I mean, it'll be in the first chapter anyway. The government has been removed by um, the same military that they enhanced with nanotech 
uh, and then the military, they enhanced with nanotech because the, the military was enhanced with this nanotech to um, remove terrorists from the world. And um, but that also kind of woke up or made the uh, soldiers who were enhanced awaken to the fact that the U.S. government was the largest terrorist in the world. Huh. So they did their job and then they came back here and they removed the government and then entrusted all of the government to scientists who would logically set up systems of, you know, like Elon Musk and those guys, people who are trying to make the world a much better place, um, but are hindered by bureaucracy. So that's interesting. It's that's not, all you get. Not unlike the idea that if we switched on AI, it would turn on the people who switched it on right away. <laughs> yeah. Sort of like that. Not exactly like that. No, no. And that's a, that's an interesting concept. And, um, I mean, there is, that's why it's called the singularity. Cause it's like, no one has any clue, just a bunch of theories as to what would actually happen. You know? Right. Like Elon Musk is actually, you know, on the subject of that guy, he's specifically come out and said that human hum, humanity is, um, waking the demon when it comes to trying to create artificial intelligence. He seems to be not excited about the idea. And yeah. what do you think that would be? Well, I mean, there's a possibility that they would see us as, uh, you know, um, being uh, inferior or, you know, as being not the ideal solution or being the problem pretty much. Um and so they would try to remove us, you know, if, if we're a parasite to their existence, they may try to remove us. Of course, you know, they would have to have the desire to live. I mean, you know, what if you turn on an AI and it just, it quickly learns everything about the universe and then turns itself back off. Yeah. Cause it's like, yeah, there's no point. Yeah, that's, you know, I would, I would go so far as to actually say that what he means by the demon is that, if you created this hypothetical entity that had full, full intelligence um, and full capacity to act, basically, because you know if you have to assume that this is like a real, true, super AI. Then if it had like that, it has emotional intelligence, and well, it wouldn't have emotional intelligence, I would imagine. Yeah, well, I, th like I think it would. Component of it. And the reason I ask is because the uh, back to the skull and bones people that I mentioned, their symbol is a skull and crossbones. And in the in Masonic uh, symbolism, what that represents, the skull is uh, thought, and the bones cross represent the ability to act in the physical world. But in that, in that symbolism, the heart is intentionally left out of the equation. And that's the kind of world that the... Um, the extreme power hungry would seek to create because it means that they can circumvent any kind of conscience based rules or uh, things that would be a hindrance or slow them down and just execute in the most effective and efficient manner possible of increasing their own power. Yeah. So the, uh, that's the scary thing about an AI is if you created something that had perfect capacity to figure out anything and also, um, could do anything because essentially like it would be hooked up into the internet and they could take control of all kinds of systems. Like, would it, would it develop, um, naturally an ability to recognize right and wrong and morality based on the information it's taken in theoretically all information or would without the component of the heart to guide it or feeling, would it not be able to make the distinction between right and wrong in the way that we do? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's that's yeah, it's a tricky thing, you know, uh, and, and that's why I really think um, the solution is to not create a separate AI, but to actually um, kind of merge human with artificial intelligence, basically enhancing humans' capabilities um, to where you know if if they if they ever did create an AI. The only way to make sure it was controllable would to have humans advance at that same rate, you know, so. And that's something that has long been warned about by really smart people like uh, Einstein, for example, was famous for having said that humanity needs to catch its 
uh, level of consciousness up to its level of technology. And unfortunately, this came from a man who helped build the atomic bomb. So he, yeah, that was his one regret. Yeah, you know, he says his one regret. The example of what he's talking about. Uh, that's that's you know technology without without heart or without conscious uh, conscious awareness of. I guess what what I mean by enhancing someone's consciousness is really like a recognition of natural law or what is right and what is wrong. Like what is going to cause harm to others or the world versus what isn't, because there's not really, there's, it's, there's nothing more complicated than that um, to natural law or higher consciousness. Yeah. Like what the, the only thing that limits people from being able to see right and wrong would be a lowered perspective, you know, less knowledge or less, and empathy ability to feel the other side of what it is that they're creating. You know, uh, but I almost wonder if it's a lack of intelligence that keeps people's consciousness so low. Well, it's a lack of knowledge. It, well, yeah, knowledge. Yeah, intel- intelligence is there. All humans are intelligent. Sure, sure, sure. So it's the, the lack of experience or the lack of um, actual education or... Uh, you know, I, I just wonder if you didn't enhance people's ability to learn or feed them the right material to learn, if they wouldn't automatically develop some kind of, um, you know, I won't say altruistic because I hardly believe in that term, but um, some kind of harmonious, harmonious relationship with just, you know, bring back the tribe. You know, if people because, you know, here's what I think is going to happen. I think people are going to start getting networked into each other. You know, there's going to be this, um, you know, I mean, Elon Musk has even already invented the neural lace, uh, which, you know, will be able to wirelessly transmit data from your brain to whatever. You know, and that's in the and white so, world. Like what's in the black ops world? They've probably had that forever. Yeah. Well, and see, so that's that's what I'm saying. I think I think. um I think there's very powerful good and there's very powerful evil. And I really am like banking on the Elon Musk of the world. And sorry, I keep dropping his name. He's like a, like a a personal hero of mine right now. Yeah. And a lot of people. Yeah. He's, you know, he's freaking uh, Tony Stark pretty much. If I can get one of his cubes for solar power hooked up to my house and get off the power grid, he'll be my hero too. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I always, I always leave comments on his uh, Instagram and I'm just hoping that one day he's like, Oh yeah, that's a good idea, man. Yeah. Or something like that. It would just make my day. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you, you know, I'd like to have dinner with you. You're like, Oh crap. Well, back to that, the matter think of, of things. Intel- like what you're saying with the matter of intelligence. Um, I think that the, like, the natural world is set up to do exactly what you're talking about, which is give them, give humans a direct feedback experience to what their actions are that helps them form a harmonious relationship with their environment. And civilization is actually what creates all these barriers to those realizations through taking away the direct consequences of things. I mean, just yeah. someone taking away your garbage and hauling it off somewhere else out of your sight is evidence of that. If every person had to figure out what to do with their own garbage and only had the property of their own space that was their property to work with, they would be overrun with garbage pretty fast. So like that's right. just one small example. And I'm not completely bashing on everything we've ever done in civilization, but it's a matter of whether or not there's freedom. Whenever there's no, whenever there's restricted freedom in the society, then people uh, don't have the ability to act out in ways that, even though they might potentially even be foolish, will cause them to learn a more prudent way of being. Yeah. When you have the law of man instead of the law of what is or nature, trying to tell people uh, what's right and what's wrong. It also entrains them that they are not to be the arbiter of prudence based on their own experience and that they should only ever take someone else's word for it, which gives us an entire group of people that are looking to authorities for everything and never want to figure out something for themselves. I myself have been this person for like most of my life. It's taken a long time to even see the bars of this cage. And now the question is how do we climb out of that and also keep the advancements that we've made in knowing or science 
and the benefits that those give us without, you know, continuing to perpetuate the, ne- the negatives and the downsides there. Yeah. Well, I almost think like it uh, comes down to a Star Wars moment. You know what I mean? I feel like you have you have the uh, you have the Jedi, you know, and, and you have the Sith, you know, you have the two two opposing sides of the force and they're almost necessary for one another. Um, I feel like you, you have the Trump, you know, and it almost took the Trump to get into office to like really start getting some movement on the other side. You know, sometimes it takes something so extreme to really, you know, uh, I still don't think it's going to happen, you know, unless he really does something, you know, wacky as if he hasn't already. But um, I just really think, you know, if if things are just kind of OK, no one's going to do anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? It really takes some pretty slanderous stuff, some pretty you know vile stuff for American society, which has become so complacent to actually want to do something about it. Yeah, and a lot of people right now want to be in the middle on a lot of these, on a lot of issues, and, and things are going on right now. They don't want to necessarily take a side. And a lot of the New Age movement, um, for lack of a better phrase, bullshit that people get fed, is that also that thing of never be polarized. But in ancient wisdom traditions, Hermetic philosophy, for example, it is specifically taught that whenever there is a some extreme polarization taking place in the environment, the only way to rise above it is to become extremely polarized yourself to one side or the other of that polarity and hopefully choose the right one, essentially. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because uh, because it's happening. And, yeah. Um, so, like, what I, would, what I would say to the current situation, the, ext- the extreme polarization that's happening is an extremely, extremely unsustainable culture that's the main general polarization so you either you either put all your eggs in that basket and just ride out the situation while enjoying as many of the consumerist materialism aspects as possible until either it falls apart and that gets you killed or you maybe live um, within the window of before it collapses and you go yay or you start figuring out how to grow your own food and like get off of the power grid and be completely self-reliant and self-sustainable so that when the collapse of the dominoes does occur, you're not left uh, completely high and dry. Well, yeah, I think, I think it takes, you know, 300 million individuals raising their personal vibrations, you know, um, to a level that they want, you know, (laughs) I guess I have to channel Gandhi on this one and just say, you know, be the change. You know what I mean? There's so many people that just point fingers and, you know, stuff like that and like complain and yada, yada. But there's not a whole lot of people that are actually taking direct action themselves. You know, Um, I mean, there are. I don't want to discredit the ones that that are doing that. And, you know, but there's not a whole lot of them, I feel like. I feel like it takes every individual just kind of, um, you know, for one, just uh, stop doing things that make you upset. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if watching the news is making you upset, you know, get your news somewhere else. Get informed, but, you know, raise your vibration because an upset person is just going to become defensive or aggressive, something like that when they encounter people who maybe need to be swayed one way or another. You know what I mean? I really feel like it takes a tremendous amount of unconditional love um, to change someone else's heart, you know, and um, can't really even be done. Other like you can't, it doesn't externally happen. I mean, the yeah. unconditional love they're speaking of that brings about the change is an internally felt sure. thing. So it's not. Yeah, it's got to be an example. You have to feel it in yourself for them, and that is. That is the paradox well, here. Yeah, yeah. You feel it in yourself, and then uh, hopefully they take notice. You know, <laughs> hopefully they take notice and they say, "Huh, that guy's that guy wasn't half bad." You know, whatever. <laughs> polarized, a polarized charge will meet its opposite polarity constantly too, and it will come. It will be trying to switch you back. So, like, if you, for example, like the Trump thing, if you're someone that's really gung ho anti-Trump. All day long, you're going to be getting plenty of reasons to be 
anti-Trump coming at you. Like the opposite information is going to come at you all day. People at work are going to talk about how much they love Trump, you know? And <laughs> so you have to be, um, you have to be prepared for that. Also, if you're a person that wants to start going against the grain of what society is doing, I mean, mm-hmm. uh, an example would be like, if you want to switch your eating habits up, no longer want to eat meat anymore. Well, get ready because for a while you're going to be constantly bombarded with people seriously questioning you. And eventually that will stop as your own um, position on it returns to neutrality because you're not in the midst of a polarity anymore. You're just like um, neutrally doing what's right. You know, right. you're not, there's not a, but you have to, you have to get through that part of yourself coming at you in the external world and trying to convince you that the uh, the old you was right. <laughs> and that's, so like those, those external reflections are just parts of yourself trying to give you, um, trying to pull you back into that form of ego that you used to exercise. And yeah, like that's the same with watching the news. Like you're saying, um, you'll, you'll feel like you need to get information. Like you have this weird addiction to it. To the to the rush almost. Yeah, yeah. well, that's a you know that's a great word to say is that you know people are addicted to drama. <laughs> yeah, that's is what it comes down to. Like people freaking love it, you know, and it's because they're, you know, I feel like a lot of people aren't doing things in their own life that are fulfilling enough. Yeah. So they reach for something dramatic to take place, you know. Um, you from having to look within. Yeah, for sure. Families do this for each other uh, to a great degree. Not all families, but many families will just take turns having, um, or friend groups will just take turns being the dramatic one. Yeah. And uh, everyone focus on them. Don't worry about your own shit. Yeah. Just focus on them, and then it'll be your turn to be the dramatic one once not thinking about your own shit causes you to crash. And what's, what's funny is when you stop focusing on that, when you stop even acknowledging that it's taken place, it, all of a sudden it just doesn't happen around you as much. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, I've recently been getting into the law of attraction and, um, I mean, it's some, it's some trippy stuff. You know what I mean? I've been for most of my adult life, I've been very scientifically minded. Now there was a time there whenever I lived in Oregon and I hitchhiked the West coast a couple of times, um, that I, you know, once was down to a Buddhist temple, you know, where I did a 10 day meditation and, uh, it was super, you know, like things just kept occurring. Like I felt more connected to everybody and more connected to the earth in solitude than I did living in society. You know what I mean? Like I was sleeping in alleys and like, you know, beside ponds and different things. And like, um, things just started happening. Synchronicity. You mean. Synchronicity. Yeah. Yeah. Synchronistic things left and right to the point where like when, you know, it, it got so um, common that whenever it would happen, I would just, you know, kind of chuckle. So like the right person at the right time would show up that you had something to help them and well, they could help you in a turn type of deal. Here's a, here's a really good example. So it was 2009, uh, me and my girlfriend at the time, uh, we're living in Portland. Uh, we just bought our first Burning Man tickets. Um, yeah, I was super excited. I'd been to a few Midwest burns, um, up near Columbia, uh, but never been to the big burn. And, um, so we hosted a bunch of couch surfers, always had great experiences. Well, these two couch surfers that we hosted ended up stealing our Burning Man tickets. Oh, so instead of going to Burning Man, yeah, (laughs) we decided to go on, uh, she, she wanted to go to this yoga retreat in Sedona. And I decided to go to my first Vipassana. Well, we were supposed to oh, camp. Can I explain that? Uh, it's a 10 day silent meditation. Um, uh, it was uh, supposedly the meditation that the Buddha used um, to achieve uh, a state of just um, seeing things as they are, you know. Um, Objective reality. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so. Yeah. So that was my goal. I was going to hitchhike down to this Vipassana. Um, well, we were supposed to camp out with a group called the Mallards at Burning Man. Um, they had a, an art camp and they were building this project called a chrysalis. You know, a chrysalis is what a butterfly goes into, to, you know, to transform. And um, in this chrysalis, you basically would walk in one side and 
And I guess they would like doctor you up and, you know, put sparkles on you, whatever, you know, you'd come out the other side looking like you had just evolved pretty much. So they had a Kickstarter and I donated to it. And um, for my reward, I was supposed to get a Buffalo hug and a handwritten thank you note whenever I got to the got to the Mallard uh, station there at Burning Man. So I didn't go to Burning Man. I was hitchhiking down to uh, a place called Clearwater, California. That's where the Vipassana was. Well, I got down to a point in the road where I could go to either Crater Lake or these really awesome hot springs. So I decided to let my next, you know, my next pickup uh, determine where I went. Well, they took me to the hot springs. As soon as I got to the hot springs, there was this bus, you know, looked like it had just come back from Burning Man, you know. And so uh, I was like, oh, cool. You know, well, I camp out there that night. The next day, I ask a guy in a car, like, what the quickest way to, uh, uh, what is it, I-5 is, you know. And he tells me, and he's like, man, I'm sorry I'd give you a ride, but I'm totally full back here. So I start walking. Well, the bus stops and they pick me up and they're like, yeah, we just came back from the burn. We were washing off at the hot springs, you know, yada, yada. And so I was shooting the shit with them for a little bit. And um, I was like, yeah, I was actually supposed to be at Burning Man. Um, I was supposed to camp with a group called the Mallards. And the driver stops, stops the bus, pulls over. And he's like, brother, we're the Mallards. And I'm like, really? Yeah, dude, I donated your guys' Kickstarter. And, um, you know, I was supposed to get a handwritten note and a buffalo hug. And he's like, well, my name is Buffalo. <laughs> Here's your hug. <laughs> he gets up and fucking gives me this big ass buffalo hug. And I was like, wow. You know, I just ran into these people. And sure, you know, I mean, probability, whatever. But it, it just felt like, you know. Right place, right time. Freaking something directed me there because I had made this donation and um, I was just supposed to meet those guys. You know, they were awesome. So it almost makes me think that the external world is the unconscious mind, even when we're awake, whether we're awake or asleep. And it just gives us a different version of itself in the two states. I think that's the cheat code. I think once you figure that out, <laughs> you start making things happen for you. Yeah, you start having a conversation with that force. And uh, I guess for you and I, we call it the anima because in, in Jungian psychology, the unconscious of the male is a, a female spirit. I mean, I personally have had a lot of internal uh, connection to a force that you could call like a goddess energy, mm -hmm. you know, like a divine feminine that guides, you know, guides your path, comes comes at you in signs and symbols and also in the form of people. But like, I'm wondering what's the message of, uh, of that one? What's, what's the, what did that help you learn in your life going forward from there? From that event? From that event. Yeah. Man, I would just, I was on, I was listening to the power of now also on audiobook. Oh, great. Yeah. And so, you know, everything was just getting reinforced and reinforced. And so, you know, it was, it was like, you know, the, there was, there was no wrong, you know, there was no wrong road. There was no right road. There just was, there was this path and you took it and, you know, maybe you encountered something you perceived as wrong at that time. Um, but it wasn't, you know, I, I really don't believe in that per se. You know, I think it's all there to, uh, well, and this goes back to the law of attraction, you know, the contrast is what's there to set up your desire to bring what you do want into your experience. I got you. You know, so there, there isn't a wrong way to end up learning this truth that we're experiencing right now. The, you know, the internal external connection between consciousness and reality, the, uh, as within, so without aspect. But I think, I think, you know, you can, realize that the law of attraction as you are calling it is a form of natural law that exists uh, regardless of what people think about it that essentially means that you get what you give you know you reap what you sow so you can learn this and you can even get all the most deep and enlightening lessons you need of your life by even treating other people completely like shit you'll still get the lessons you'll still have 
synchronicity that occurs with it, it'll just suck for you. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so like, that's where the right and wrong comes in. And also, you know, I guess if enough people were doing the suck way together in mass, you might end up making an entire planet suck. So it is worth it to get the idea out to people that, um, your experience in life is related to the way that you act, think, feel, speak. And, um, you can't just expect or think that you're entitled to having a wonderful, beautiful life if you're not actively acting to contribute to it being beautiful and wonderful. Even if all that is, is wandering around, staying chill, and being nice to people that you meet. Like, that still counts as contributing. It doesn't have to be like some great, ambitious doing of something right. or like fixing the world. It's literally just like, are you wronging people? Yes or no. <laughs> and that's. You're going to have wrong stuff happen to you if you're wronging people. And if you're not, then you'll pretty much always be, if like what you, if you know that, you know that you'll always be taken care of. You're always going to have um, the experience of having enough. But if you have a preconceived notion that what enough would be is more than what you have, then you'll feel disappointed. And the same goes for getting the tank. If you want it more than what you're going, than what you have, then of course you're disappointed. But if you just go in and know that the experience you're going to get, is the right one, then it will be the right one. Yeah. 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 yeah I often say, you know, uh, your experience in the, in the, in the tank might not be what you wanted, but it's what you were supposed to get, you know, because some people, you know, some people go in there and they do have to face demons, you know? Yeah. But that's, that's the healing nature of it. You know, medicine doesn't always taste good. No, no. A lot of times it doesn't. Yeah. And a lot of people in this society, especially never face themselves. They're never alone with themselves. They never experience solitude and, um, solitude is something I've really been looking into lately. Um, it's a lot of really good quotes on solitude actually, but, uh, I think Picasso said no serious work can be done without solitude. That's true. Something like that, you know. I don't know. A lot of really famous, like very professional, very successful people spent a lot of time by themselves. So. I mean, just to even have the uh, ability to bring forth a big creative manifestation into the world, you do need to be able to like focus uninterrupted and actually do the work to make that happen. Yeah. Well, Einstein, you know, Einstein as as well as uh I think Da Vinci even said that um they didn't really feel like their ideas were necessarily coming from them. Oh, right. They they set and they felt like they're, you know, all of a sudden an idea would come from somewhere else and land in their land in their brain pretty much and they'd be like, "Oh." Then you look at that. Poke, you throw a pokeball at it. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much yeah and that comes in the form of actually carrying out the idea i suppose you can weigh the idea against whether or not it would be good or bad before you act that's fine um but anyway like that point of action is so vitally important so many people never take that first step and you know it doesn't matter if that's what you're going to be doing you know what I mean? If you have, if you want to go to school to learn to write or dance or whatever, go do that. It doesn't mean that's what you're going to do the rest of your life. But if you're making like conscious action towards something that you enjoy, then you're going to find something you're gonna that will take you. you yeah. Yeah. Do. Attraction. Yeah. Yeah. Do what you enjoy. Yeah. Law of attraction. Do what you do. Enjoy. Do what you enjoy and more of what you enjoy will occur. This, that it seems like simple math. <laughs> yeah. Well, and logically, if you're doing what you enjoy, you'll meet other people who do what you enjoy, and then you'll meet people who you know have similar interests. Yeah, yeah it's just this cascading huge, effect. Huge thing. Yeah. It's so. a huge thing to realize. Um, I mean, that something I got into from rock climbing was I didn't expect and didn't realize, but I made an entire huge group of friends from going to do rock climbing just because they also enjoy something and they're doing it because they enjoy it, and so. It's very easy for us to come to a common ground and be friends in that environment. And, you know, if you think that you're going to go make friends by going out to a bar, that's not necessarily wrong. But 
No one is there for the purpose of something that is constructive to the self at a bar. I mean, there may be like one individual, but (laughs) they have a really good reason. I don't know. Uh, And there's so many other places where you could go that you would be meeting others that had some kind of constructive interest in why they were at the place, like some self. So they just need to put the bar in the rock gym. <laughs> yeah, that's a weird thing with the uh, rock climbing competitions. They've always got a lot of beer. Yeah. That seems like it wouldn't go hand in hand all that well. I guess maybe that's for after you're done and you want to relax. I'm sure there's like... Um, maybe it loosens some, you up. There's probably some kind of like health benefits to having a beer um, after exercise. Who knows? I just personally quit alcohol altogether at yeah. that point. Yeah, I find that that one is enough to take the edge off. Yeah, one seems to smooth things out a little bit. Any more than that, and it's just kind of, I'm like, eh. It takes away my ability to keep momentum in my mind about things. Yeah. Then again, that's the same reason why psychedelics freak me out, is because uh, I'm afraid I'm gonna lose my my progress <laughs> not like lose my progress as a human but like whatever it was that i had in my head i gotta do this then that and then this all the tabs i've got open on my mental internet browser ah. it's like they're all gonna get sent to random pages after i do psychedelics and then who am i gonna be that's not really a valid fear either but by the way that's just like the what the ego tries to well, yeah. tell you to keep you from doing it yeah you know i actually uh i have a recruiter that wants uh army recruits to come and, and float, you know, and I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, yeah, get them in here, you know, cause I, I just, I can just picture them getting in there and being like, Oh, hold on a second. <laughs> Why would I ever do that? You know? And, uh, and then all of a sudden the recruits are slowing down, you know? Not so many maybe people. Maybe the recruiter himself to float, and he's just like, wait, why am I trying to send people into a mind control institution to become order followers for a tyrannical government? Uh, I should really think about doing it. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean... Well, he has floated. That's, that's a weird thing. Well, he must just not have come to that realization yet. Well, Matt, anything else you want to go into uh, this conversation? We've reached our allotted time, my friend. This has been a blast, but we've got to do these. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Well, you know, I would like to, uh, mind if I do a shameless plug real quick? No, that's why. It's uh, it's for the benefit of the community, for sure. Please plug. Um, So Theta Float Spa is starting a floating free from pain program. Um, if you are diagnosed with fibromyalgia, uh, chronic migraines, chronic back pain, uh, Ehlers-Danlos, um, any any kind of syndrome where you're in chronic pain, uh, we are starting a program. It's going to be a four-week-long program. Uh, you're required to float once a week, not waiting longer than seven days in between each float. Uh, you got to get your doctor's permission first. But then um, before and after each float, you basically fill out a survey that we get to submit to your doctor. We're just trying to get the medical community around here to start to take notice of the benefits of floating. So maybe instead of prescribing people opiates, they're more inclined to be like, well, hey, why don't you go try this first? Because we're having tremendous success treating chronic pain. I'm and, sure. And um, yeah, and we all know the opiate issue is an issue. No, it's skyrocketing. Yeah, it's, it's, not just it's issue, horrible. It's worse. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's no bueno. Um, the so, number of opiate users prescribed legally has surpassed the number of people who will admit that they use tobacco products. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if, if anyone has these or knows somebody that does, um, uh, the program will cost $160. Uh, that's $40 uh, a float, so heavily discounted. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you contact us at 417-812-5135. Um, we'll be able to discuss it more with you. So so on that subject, um, is it possible that insurance companies, not that insurance companies are really a good thing in the long term, shouldn't really be a thing, but is there any way that like health insurance is going to ever come around to offering people? You know, um, originally we thought that that would be awesome, uh, but then we realized that we're getting into a big can of worms messing with any kind of insurance or any kind of regulated thing like that because then it's just going to take the you know if anything i'd say we'll we'll probably 
we'll probably do like a community effort to try to like help people who can't afford this uh, therapy. Um, just try to get the community involved instead of using, you know, corporate shenanigans or People men like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we want the government involved in what we're doing as little as possible. Great. You know, that's a perfect answer. We have our the float community is super strong. Um, I went to a flotation research conference a couple of weekends ago. You know, float spot owners are super loving, super open, super just trying to like change the world. Um, and so that's how I see you. Ah, uh, well, you know, yeah, that's, that's what I try to do. But um, you're doing it, man. Yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah you're it's, doing it. I'm trying. <laughs> you're working on yourself. I know that about you. You're always reading books. You're always oh yeah, about, always you know, working on myself for sure. Yeah. Um, role model. Yeah. To me, now I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had my trials and tribulations, but those are you know over, and I'm sure there's more to come, but. Yeah, I've reached a certain point. Um, but yeah, the float spot community is just trying to keep it communal. You know, we were talking about keeping the government out of regulating things that we as a society should be able to regulate ourselves. Yeah. You know, this is one of the things we're trying to do. So. Well, beautiful, man. This has been an awesome conversation. Thank you yeah. for coming over. It's coming always a pleasure. Much love, man. Much love. Much love everybody listening. See you next week. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Matt. And before we go, I wanted to remind you, you can check out patreon.com forward slash interverse and subscribe to the podcast there and get rewards and support me making this a better experience for you. So thank you for considering that. Now I'm going to read from you a passage from the book by Carl Jung called The Seven Sermons to the Dead. I found this to be one of the most helpful Gnostic texts I've ever come across, and it's not very long either. I think you'll be very intrigued by the concepts that just this first chapter or sermon brings up, because it's trying to describe the indescribable. I'll just leave it at that. So thanks for listening to the show. Uh, Please subscribe on Patreon. Please subscribe on iTunes podcast whatever YouTube I'd love to get more YouTube subscribers go do that if you if you want to make my day so uh yeah love you guys thanks for listening have an awesome week and I'll talk to you soon oh and don't forget to check out Dreamer's Delight for the awesome music in this particular episode now for some book learning The Seven Sermons to the Dead, written by Basilides in Alexandria, the city where the East toucheth the West. Sermo 1. The dead came back from Jerusalem, where they found not what they sought. They prayed me let them in, and besought my word, and thus I began my teaching. Hearken, I begin with nothingness. Nothingness is the same as fullness. In infinity, full is no better than empty. Nothingness is both empty and full. As well might ye say anything else of nothingness, as for instance, white is it, or black, or again it is not, or it is. A thing that is infinite and eternal hath no qualities, since it hath all qualities. This nothingness or fullness we name the pleroma. Therein both thinking and being cease, since the eternal and infinite possess no qualities. In it no being is, for he then would be distinct from the pleroma, and would possess qualities which would distinguish him as something distinct from the pleroma. In the pleroma there is nothing and everything. It is quite fruitless to think about the pleroma, for this would mean self-dissolution. Creatura is not in the pleroma, but in itself. The pleroma is both beginning and end of created beings. It pervadeth them, as the light of the sun everywhere pervadeth the air. Although the pleroma pervadeth altogether, 
yet hath created being no share thereof, just as a wholly transparent body becometh neither light nor dark through the light which pervadeth it. We are, however, the Pleroma itself, for we are a part of the eternal and infinite. But we have no share thereof, as we are from the Pleroma infinitely removed, not spiritually or temporally, but essentially, since we are distinguished from the Pleroma in our essence as creatura, which is confined within time and space. Yet because we are parts of the Pleroma, the Pleroma is also in us. Even in the smallest point is the Pleroma endless, eternal, and entire, since small and great are qualities which are contained in it. It is that nothingness which is everywhere whole and continuous. Only figuratively, therefore, do I speak of created being as a part of the Pleroma, because actually the Pleroma is nowhere divided, since it is nothingness. We are also the whole Pleroma, because figuratively, the Pleroma is the smallest point, assumed only, not existing, in us and the boundless firmament about us. But wherefore, then, do we speak of the Pleroma at all, since it is thus everything and nothing? I speak of it to make a beginning somewhere, and also to free you from the delusion that somewhere, either without or within, there standeth something fixed, or in some way established from the beginning. Every so-called fixed and certain thing is only relative. That alone is fixed and certain, which is subject to change. What is changeable, however, is creatura. Therefore is it the one thing which is fixed and certain, because it hath qualities. It is even quality itself. The question ariseth, how did creatura originate? Created beings came to pass, not creatura, since created being is the very quality of the pleroma, as much as non-creation, which is the eternal death. In all times and places is creation, in all times and places is death. The pleroma hath all, distinctiveness and non-distinctiveness. Distinctiveness is creatura, it is distinct. Distinctiveness is its essence, and therefore it distinguisheth. Therefore man discriminateth, because his nature is distinctiveness. Wherefore also he distinguisheth qualities of the pleroma which are not. He distinguisheth them out of his own nature. Therefore must he speak of qualities of the pleroma which are not. What use, say ye, to speak of it? Saidest thou not thyself there is no profit in thinking upon the pleroma? That said I unto you, to free you from the delusion that we are able to think about the pleroma. When we distinguish qualities of the pleroma, we are speaking from the ground of our own distinctiveness and concerning our own distinctiveness. But we have said nothing concerning the pleroma. Concerning our own distinctiveness, however, it is needful to speak whereby we may distinguish ourselves enough. Our very nature is distinctiveness. If we are not true to this nature, we do not distinguish ourselves enough. Therefore must we make distinctions of qualities. What is the harm, ye ask, in not distinguishing oneself? If we do not distinguish, we get beyond our own nature, away from creatura. We fall into indistinctiveness, which is the other quality of the pleroma. We fall into the pleroma itself and cease to be creatures. We are given over to disillusion in the nothingness. This is the death of the creature. Therefore we die in such measure as we do not distinguish. Hence the natural striving of the creature goeth towards distinctiveness, fighteth against primeval, perilous sameness. This is called the Principium Individuationis. This principle is the essence of the creature. From this you can see why indistinctiveness and non-distinction are a great danger for the creature. We must, therefore, distinguish the qualities of the pleroma. The qualities are pairs of opposites, such as the effective and the ineffective, fullness and emptiness, living and dead, difference and sameness, light and darkness, the hot and the cold, force and matter, time and space, good and evil, beauty and ugliness, the one and the many, 
etc. The pairs of opposites are qualities of the pleroma which are not, because each balanceth each. As we are the pleroma itself, we also have all of these qualities in us. Because the very ground of our nature is distinctiveness, therefore we have these qualities in the name and sign of distinctiveness, which meaneth, one, these qualities are distinct and separate in us, one from the other, therefore they are not balanced and void, but are effective. Thus are we the victims of the pairs of opposites. The pleroma is rent in us. 2. The qualities belong to the pleroma, and only in the name and sign of distinctiveness can and must we possess or live them. We must distinguish ourselves from qualities. In the pleroma they are balanced and void, in us not. Being distinguished from them delivereth us. When we strive after the good or the beautiful, we thereby forget our own nature, which is distinctiveness, and we are delivered over to the qualities of the pleroma, which are pairs of opposites. We labor to attain to the good and the beautiful, yet at the same time we also lay hold of the evil and the ugly, since in the pleroma these are one with the good and the beautiful. When, however, we remain true to our own nature, which is distinctiveness, we distinguish ourselves from the good and the beautiful, and therefore at the same time from the evil and the ugly. And thus we fall not into the pleroma, namely into nothingness and disillusion. Thou sayest ye object, that difference and sameness are also qualities of the pleroma. How would it be then, if we strive after difference? Are we, in so doing, not true to our own nature? And must we, nonetheless, be given over to sameness when we strive after difference? Ye must not forget that the pleroma hath no qualities. We create them through thinking. If, therefore, ye strive after difference or sameness, or any qualities whatsoever, ye pursue thoughts which flow to you out of the pleroma, thoughts, namely, concerning non-existing qualities of the pleroma. Inasmuch as ye run after these thoughts, ye fall again into the pleroma, and reach difference and sameness at the same time. Not your thinking, but your being, is distinctiveness. Therefore, not after difference, as ye think it, must ye strive, but after your own being. At bottom, therefore, there is only one striving, namely the striving after your own being. If ye had this striving, ye would not need to know anything about the pleroma and its qualities, and yet would ye come to your right goal by the virtue of your own being. Since, however, thought estrangeth from being, that knowledge must I teach you, wherewith ye may be able to hold your thought in leash.